And Sami, you brought up a really awesome concept last week. And I said, hey, let's, let's have some more discussion this week. Uh, do you want to kind of chat through your initial thoughts on uh, kind of item two there? Yeah, so <clears throat> this is what we used to do at, uh, at HP. Um, so in, in my group, at least. So one of the things we used to do was track the top 10, 20% deals, which bring the maximum revenue. Um, the goal there was slightly different. Basically, the goal was to maybe assist the sales teams in case they need help uh, from product management. So I used to be in product management at that time. Um, and then we used to work with the sales teams, get onto customer calls if required and so on. Now, um, I think the goal that we have here is probably slightly more different. It's more from addressing a messaging point of view, um, you know, perhaps improving our messaging based on uh, the deals and the conversations that uh, sales reps are having. So we might need to listen into a few chorus calls, talk to the specific sales reps. So I'm guessing it might be um, 20, 25 deals. I haven't looked at the dashboard lately, but um, that's what I think. And we might also then want to look at some commercial deals as well. So in total, we can, my, my thought was, we could take a, an overall of about 30, 40 deals and split it across the team. Um, and then, you know, maybe in, in a few quarters, we have a good, uh, good understanding of, of how the conversations are flowing uh, for the sales reps, where the gaps are from a messaging point of view, what use cases are working, what's not working and so on, right? A lot of that information might be qualitative, uh, things that we are not going to get directly from SFDC. So we might want to start um, working directly with the teams uh, uh, and getting this information from Corus as well. So uh, a couple of things to unpack there. So I, I think that our goals as a team in keeping abreast of and reviewing um, some segment of deals that we are involved in. And let's chat a little bit about like, is it top revenue deals? We have, have to have commercial in the mix, which you know any one of those is not gonna be like a top revenue. So we, got, we have to, let's talk about that a little bit. But even ahead of that, um, let's chat for a moment about our goals in this exercise, because I think it goes far, far, far beyond just messaging. And I think it's about the charter of our team like, um, what are what are we responsible for, and what what should what should be within our domain? And I would say that uh, there's kind of two things. So yes, messaging, hundred percent. And then in addition to that, there are two other elements that come to mind. So one is to assist in the deal. Also, I would say that um, in most of the places where I've been a PMM, the the times I felt best about my role is when my PM has said, you could swap out William for me. Like I've had enough of the relationship where I understood the product, the roadmap. Um, we had a tight enough relationship that if I was in a customer call or an analyst call or whatever, whatever feedback I received, I could convey that with high fidelity to the PM. Um, I think that level of tight PM, PMM, uh, kind of relationship is, is difficult when we have like a one to 10 ratio, but um, we have almost a one to one ratio at the group manager level. So <laughs> um, all that's to say is, is I would say that um, I think Cindy, you do this really, really well. Um, I know I used to do this a lot more and candidly, I, I haven't done it in a while, but um especially when there used to be a lot of Kubernetes deals, I would join calls and serve as the, the expert on that um, market knowledge of how the industry was working, of what other tools were and how the ecosystem played, and in particular, of what Gillab's capabilities were. So I would say that idea of like helping the deal move further is absolutely something that this team uh, should have as part of like on our you know, bat utility belt. 
I don't know if that analogy makes sense. Batman had like a bunch of stuff on his belt. So he had like, you know, if there's like a hundred things on the PMM tool belt, that's at least one of them. Uh, I'm kind of rambling. The, the second, so help the deal along. And then also for us to understand the buyer's journey as a core competency. So I would say an, a goal for the entire team should be if you gave us a whiteboard, we should be able to construct from memory all of the steps that a buyer goes through from like, haven't heard about GitLab yet to talking at commit, right? So from like acquisition, the R pirate metrics, like, you know, to referral, to becoming like a referral customer, what are all those steps in that journey? And we should be able to whiteboard that. And so in order for us to understand the, the half of that, that is like, okay, now there's an opportunity and then sales goes and works that opportunity. We should be familiar with that process and know it and understand it and be able to whiteboard it and um, be able to help optimize that. That's essentially what a sales play is. I, although there's, we're still defining sales plays, just an aside, Harsh has done a ton of sales plays and I think is really, really gonna help us out here. So just one aside there, but um, I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> What do y'all think about those points? Helping sales and understanding the buyer's journey. Um, so in my previous role as PM, um, I used to do a bunch of those things, right? So like, like you mentioned, um, but here, since we're still uh, defining the roles um, accurately, I, that's why I called out messaging, but I absolutely agree with what you're saying about us being point on calls, uh, talking about the market knowledge, about where the industry is going, what the competitive um, uh, environment is and so on. So totally agree. Cool, and, and then Cindy, I know, like I said, I think you do this really, really well. Um, any just kind of thoughts now on as we just kind of set goals or directions uh, that you'd share with the team on just being engaged with the sales process? Well, in terms of what, where, how I contribute and what uh, the purpose, I guess, of my participation in the sales process is to, to accelerate the sales cycle. Um, by, by by removing barriers, really uh, overcoming objections at kind of a deeper level than what the sales team can. Um, I do give feedback to the PMs as well and pull in the, the appropriate PM for an even deeper discussion when appropriate. So I'm kind of doing a little bit of triage to try to shield the PMs from generic discussions. Um, yeah, but in term and in the messaging, yeah, I absolutely. I try out messaging on them and continue to refine it. You know, one of the things that when I was shadowing Sid, he was doing the, the non funding funding tour, <laughs> you know, so he was talking to investors without trying to raise money yet. This was just to plant the seeds and every investor meeting he would go into, he would come out and say, what could I have done better every single time? And I've tried to do that when I meet with customers, what could I do better? How can I evolve the message? Hmm. Where's a miss, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it is, to Samia's point about messaging, it's an opportunity to continually refine the message. So, so yeah, so I think there's, there would be like four goals on us being involved in the, in the sales process and the sales cycle. Um, primary research of our messaging. And uh, Parker, I think you listened to this call as well. I, I think I linked it maybe last week. Uh, it was the last call I had with Pyle, Somers, O'Neill, Hong. Uh, anyway, O'Neill said this, he just said this concept of, it was like, um, our research on messaging should be research on 
user, on the primary buyers. So, so one of the things that he wanted us to avoid was something like going to the sales team and asking the sales team what messaging works for you, which would be like a, a step removed. Instead, we should be directly talking to, to customers and prospects like Cindy uh, is doing to try out that messaging directly on the market and get that direct feedback. And I just kind of think of this like, um, yeah, in the same way that a PM would iterate on the features and what, you know, they ship a feature and who's using it and they get feedback on that. Same thing with us on messaging, doing that primary research. So but it's not just sales calls too. You can get that from events and round tables and uh, other things too. Uh, totally agree. Yeah. So our, our higher level goal is like market tested messaging. And then there's several places to do that, one of which is the sales cycle. And so coming at it from the other end, we're saying like, why should we be involved in the sales cycle? And well, it, it hits that goal of, of market tested messaging. So we say market tested messaging, knowing the buyer's journey, assisting sales on key deals as a subject matter expert and uh, PM tri triage assisting. Um, we get feedback and pass it to them. There's like a, uh, an element where we we act as a, the hand of the PM, or an assist you know assisting them on on their direct feature um, work. Uh, the same way that I think that that they do that they would do that for us for messaging as well, that there would be a team. Um, cool. So quick question, yeah. Cindy, on the calls that you do get on with with sales, is it something that? you look up on SFTC and talk to the sales rep and get onto those calls? Or is it the other way around? You get invited into those calls? I get invited. I, yep. Um, I was going to say it's organic for you, right? You, you naturally get invited and I think probably at a much higher rate than the rest of us. So my question was going to be, Leo, get up, buddy. Sorry, you can't. Sorry. Um, how do we get the same You've percentage? Because UX person. team is going they're all going so i don't want to add one more net new we need to be looped in well you need to if you establish yourself as a subject matter expert in a particular topic they will naturally loop you in because if they're talking with somebody that's going to go deep on that topic they want to have someone there to back them up on questions so um you know whether it's ci or kubernetes or um you know, whatever, get off, pick a topic and just become the expert on that. And part of it is knowing not only what we do and how we do it better, but what the, the rest of the market. So how to, how do our competitors work? Um, what are the common objections? What's going on in the market? Um, you know, I get all that. I'm just saying, how do we, but how do like, it's still, there's a, there's a forcing function that we need to be invited. Like, I think we're, you know, we can't overnight change the perception of other people. And I think we all have a pretty good, um, as well, like, I think we have a good area where we're subject matter experts. What, how, how, well, how often the, do you get pulled in? Cause it's like yeah, probably like once, once a week, but what I, okay. so the other thing that I do though, um, I have relationships with some of the reps and I've done a few things with them so that they just naturally like David Wells calls me into every security deal. Just gotcha. because he's found that it can go faster when he does. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is in QBRs, I look for um, big ultimate opportunities and cool. I have kind of a running list that I keep. And then, and I, if I don't hear from some of those reps, I have, on occasion, not very often, but on occasion I've reached out and I could see where you guys definitely would do that to get your foot in the door with them. So find some mm -hmm. big CI deals and reach out to those reps and say, Hey, I, you know, you could e either offer to help or offer to just ride along and listen, um, for feedback either way. I think they would, they would welcome the engagement. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think all, all of the, and coming back to like all there's, so there's kind of three bits of advice there. I think one is um, being an SME and deepening your, your subject matter expertise and maybe even in some ways evangelizing that 
Uh, so it's like being the SME, uh, building the relationship with sales and uh, keeping your list of top deals. And I would yep. say that that's been the same thing for me when I've been invited to calls. It's been because of those things. Like folks invited me in because I knew about a technology and yep. um, candidly, this is probably why I used to get invited in a ton and it's tapered off a bit because all the reps I had really good rapport with or you know, have maybe left GitLab. So it's now incumbent on me to continue to build those relationships. And I think all sure. of us. Um, and then towards the keeping the list of top deals, that's like the topic at hand, right? Yeah. So to Samia's original point of why should we keep a, you know, keep abreast of kind of top deals of the quarter? Uh, yeah, one of those ways is, is we can do a reach out. We can reach out to that rep and be like, hey, I, I saw that you're working on deal X and that deal is a CI deal or that deal is a GitOps deal. Um, I do, I actually got pinged on GitOps the other day and I, I think I sent them your way, Samia. Um, and it's not coming to mind what the specific deal was, but I think those are kind of the three, three ways. So this is like, that makes sense. I think that's the one I'm missing. Cause I feel like personally, I throw myself out there a lot. Like every QBR, every SD, every interaction I have, I'm like, Hey, we're here. Use us. I'm very, very serious about it. So and it happens just not at the rate that I would like. Um, I think having that list would be good. You might need to be more specific about how, suggesting how they can use you. So yeah. give them the very specific information about, um, you know, I can help you overcome concerns with Jenkins or I can help you overcome, you know, that yeah. be specific. And because otherwise it's a great idea, but they may not think to engage you because it's a broad, yeah. I'm not sure what, what he could do. I get what you're saying. And I think, I think if you think about it as well, like what are the biggest challenges for our sales team, right? Like they want to um, sell ultimate. That's like their number one goal, right? Yeah. So security is the, is today is the way that we sell ultimate. And agile, agile is quickly becoming a way that we do that. So Cindy and Cormac are, they're just going to be pulled into more deals. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Sales reps are hungry to sell ultimate, but there are a lot of motions. There are land with GitOps motions. There's a ton of accounts where we, we can't get in with the dev team, but we definitely get in with the ops team and the, the folks trying to do IAC. Yeah. So that land motion, I think Samia is one that you could get looped into. And then Parker, I think that there is a lot of either land with CI where they want SCM and CI, or uh, here's this SCM account and we need to get them to adopt more things. And CI yeah, is the agree. gateway to security, right? So in a lot of ways, if before they can even have Sydney come and help them and talk about how great security is, they really need to get on the CI train. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, so anyway, I think I think Sydney and Cormac are always going to get pinged more just because that's where the that's where the dollars are. And because they rock. Well, and because they're great too. Uh, so coming down then to chat about keeping track of some number of deals. Each of us has like, this is our list of deals that we track. Um, let's see, I'm gonna start like a new item here, item F, uh, which deals to track. So let me, let me ask this, Cindy, I think you probably do this the most formally where you have a list. I have had a list in the past, I don't currently. Does anybody else have a list or a report or any um, thing like that? Mm -mm. Let, let me ask this, are, are all of your deals, Cindy, enterprise deals or do you track any SMB or mid-market? Just enterprise, because I, I only get involved in the really big ones, honestly. So, let me raise this question, which I think, I think makes sense. I think when it's a very high dollar amount that warrants our time. Um, and also those sales cycles tend to be more complex and involve more stakeholders and require our time. But what do you, how do you all think we get involved with SMB and mid-market? What's, what's our path to surface area there? I don't know. I mean, honestly, I don't have time to get involved in ones for 30 seats or 
something. I, I'll only do the small seats if it's a big company that has 2,000 developers. So they're just trying it out with 30 seats, but they have a potential to grow to 2,000. It's just not worth my time to get involved in all of the, the onesie twosies. I think it would be good to understand what challenges they have. And I, if I had more time, um, it would be nice to go listen to some of the chorus calls to see, sorry, to see um, how those conversations go and understand what barriers they come up against that just don't have enough hours in the day. And I would say the way, the way we should look at like the structure of it is not necessarily like if I had more bandwidth, I'd do X, but like, what do we prioritize? So the, so in my thought process is if, if we're only involved in enterprise deals, um, that's pro that's, I don't think that that works for the business and there should be some amount of bandwidth. So maybe there's like, if we're like have our top seven enterprise deals, maybe we only get involved in the top five and we just say no to those other two. And the reason we do that is to have some surface area to mid-market and SMB. And the thought process there is that if we can similarly like hone the messaging and hone the process, right? We understand that buyer's journey. And so we can, uh, understand the process that's working and we can proliferate that and help to proliferate that. Uh, you know, if you have a good SMB motion and you can, you can figure that out with a, with some small surface area, but then you can scale that and that can scale really, really broadly quickly. So it could similarly drive a lot of revenue. Right. Let's say um, we can, you know, use the SMB and market as proving grounds in certain areas, right. Enable better and, and like, you know, I don't know, get things ready. There are certain areas where enterprise is going to be different, right? It's going to need different messaging. There's different pains, blah, blah, blah. But where they aren't, as far as enabling our team, you know, like spend time to make sure the SDRs and mid-market and, and SMB are, are ready to rock and, and performing at a high level, right? And like doing things to kind of like be our eyes and ears while we're there um, to be able to focus more time on enterprise. I agree with that. So I've got, yeah, go ahead. I've got two, oh, two, two thoughts. One, one is that um, some mid-market deals can be like enterprise deals where, you know, it has a little bit of a longer cycle and there is a key stakeholder sell. And I would say, even though the dollar amount and the eventual vision of any individual mid-market deal, you know, so you might go into enterprise and you might be like, well, we're selling, we're landing with 30 seats, but there's mm -hmm. the potential for 2000. And you might look at this mid-market deal and it's like, well, we're selling 30 seats. Uh, welcome, Cormac. Uh, we're selling 30 seats, but there's the potential for 500. So the potential isn't as high, but the potential for all mid-market, right? If we can hone that process and hone that messaging, potential for all mid-market can be, can be huge. So it's, it's worth it for us to be in this one mid-market deal where the potential is only 500 seats because we're going to scale that across mid-market. Um, so, so I think mid-market is a place to get involved with deals and then SMB, again, it's kind of like understanding their cycle and, and for them, they're just like, they have so many freaking accounts. They can't reach out to them all, all personally. So they're looking for like templates, uh, and scaled ways to reach out, whether that's like scaled emails or content, they're looking to do a lot of like automated processes. And so again, it's kind of like working with the rep to understand their process, helping them hone their messaging. It's almost like the work you're doing, Samia, with the SDRs. Where SDRs similar, like their their reach out is so broad, they're templatizing it. And they and and you know, I think everybody probably gets like crappy email templates every day. You know how painful those are. So if our if we can help our reps with some uh you know some good messaging and some good emails to send out. Uh, I think that that helps out a ton. So um, Brian and Cormac, what we were just discussing was the team's cadence on being involved in sales deals. And so uh, Samia brought up the, the concept of maybe each of us tracks the top five to seven 
deals by revenue, uh, let's say over the quarter, we are saying these are the top deals of the quarter. And then that seems like a good idea. And then the only caveat I'm adding to that is that any one SMB deal or any one mid-market deal is never going to be the, the top deal by revenue, but we need to have commercial as part of like the work that we do. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, so looking, um, and it's in the shared folder, but just looking at that Agile, um, the Agile Opportunities report I pulled, I was surprised that there were a few opportunities, uh, mid-market opportunities that were actually really big and in the top three or four. Hmm. Um, but I don't know if they were initially tagged as mid-market because mid-market grows to enterprise. So they're, they're, that could have happened over time. Um, Our numbers are awkward. I think other... Other companies, I think, stop at like a thousand if it's a thousand and above, yeah. but we consider a thousand to two thousand mid market. Right. Which, which, I mean, we are a mid market company, which is so, yeah, that's right. Whereas to other companies prospecting to us, we'd be an enterprise, we'd be part of their enterprise segment. Yeah. I think uh, I've worked at places where 500 plus was small enterprise too. So, um, and, and if we're landing and not, if we're landing small, with vision, some of these enterprise deals, you know, could be, you know, initially smaller than the mid-market ones too. But, but one of the things that I've been looking at with the agile is I've been trying to make sure that I look at, you know, the top N from each segment. And um, I feel like, I mean, maybe that, maybe that's wrong because maybe the bulk of our revenue is still going to come from enterprise, but it seems like, you know, hedging our bets or I've, a lot of those mid-market deals, just going to the SMB QBRs, in the mid-market QBRs, um, people are always upset that uh, their deals outgrew them and moved up to enterprise and enterprise stole it from them. So, so you know the uh, wins key deals, Chan, on Slack, is there any magic to its algorithm on what, what appears there as a key deal or a key win that we could, we could use? That there a, used to be a, a link to it in the channel description. It's not there anymore. That is a good question. Uh, I was just going to say, let's take some time to get to like tactics or to do's. Um, as one to do, Brian, would you be willing to try to track that down and find out who yeah. populates that channel and report back to the team? Yeah, I'll find out. Okay. Because uh, I think that that this... could help us out. How do they, what do they call a key deal? So I was just uh, fiddling around with Salesforce right now, and it looks like you can't search using your keywords and you might be able to find specific deals which have those keywords in them. So I looked up for infrastructure as code. Normally deals are not tagged as GitOps and so on, but I found a bunch of deals tagged as infrastructure as code, not tagged, but had it in their comments. So that might be a way to find deals that you want to get plugged into as well. Is that a, is that a report that you can run for that keyword? It, Maybe we can. I haven't tried that. I just tried doing a search and maybe I can export that. I'm not sure. I, I'm not an expert on, on Salesforce, but at least the, there is a way to uh, for people like me, um, which is not tagged to a particular tier and not a popular use case to find uh, deals where I can get plugged into. So. Yeah, so... Uh... There's a couple, I have a couple other thoughts here. So I know that Pyle has, I think even like a weekly meeting. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll take, you know, last time I showed up, they were really, really happy. And Canada, the last time I poked into this was, um, if you remember, John tried to get us on this train a while ago, and John was like, hey, each of you, these are your uh, stable counterparts in sales. And I feel like that was really heading us on the right track, and I'd like to get back to that where we have things we're focusing on. My, my thought for it is like, all of us should have some expertise across all segments, mid-market enterprise, SMB, and PubSec. So that way, like, you know, like, Samia, if you're if you're only focused on mid market and all the GitOps messaging is is mid market and none of it's 
hits pub, the pub sec market or none of it hits the enterprise market, right? Um, so all of us need a little bit of knowledge across and then some of us need, need to go deep in some of those areas. So um, I wanna get to that. All that's to say is I know that Pyle used to have a weekly meeting and I'll, I'll take it to do to poke back into that to find out what deals are on that. Because uh, yes, QBRs is a great way because they'll, they'll, reps will talk about in the QBR what their top deals upcoming are. But I think that this also evolves. Uh, I, I'm thinking for a moment, I, I was thinking like, is it worth like somebody or some, some of us going through the last set of QBRs and just pulling out, like making a list of those top deals. Does that sound like a good use of time or should we like curb that and use other tactics now and wait until Q3, but then when we attend Q3 QBRs, that will be a list we want to generate. What do y'all think, think about? Be, I mean, uh, am I be, I'm not muted, sorry. I'm keeping on mute because dog goes back here too in a way. Um, like I, I think about that during them sometimes. I'll like tag myself to come back for stuff. And, and, and sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And I know before we had gone to the point where it was like open an issue for everything. Maybe we can meet in like a middle ground and like whether it's all of us or one of us. And sometimes I'll see something that's like security. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, oh, Cindy. And then a lot of times you've already seen it to be completely honest. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think it'd be good to keep our eyes out. Yeah, I think it, an issue for everything we hear way too much, we're, we're not going to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I would say in the next set of QBRs, um, an artifact that I would like the team to generate out of those QBRs is a list of the top deals, right? So That's whether, good. well, maybe we put it in an issue or maybe a Google Doc, but the idea is like every, every rep puts their top deals in their slide deck and so we would then just like pull that one bit of information. So you could just look at this one doc and be like, these are the top deals that people are pursuing. Right. Yeah. So generate that artifact on the next set of QBRs. And then my question is, is it worth going back to the last set of QBRs and spending some time to generate that artifact? I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm kind of asking if what you all think about that. Since we got to do some research on here, you know, I think it may be, uh, especially since there's an extenuating circumstance and we're going to be pivoting a little bit, doing some research. I think it may be a good idea. And we could just do like one issue, right? For all of us, like QBR takeaways, have like a section for top deals, maybe a section where we each add a few bullet points on something we found interesting. That would be kind of easier to wield. Um, but I think that's a good idea, personally. Okay, I'll... I'll say that's like a that's like an optional idea. If you find yourself some spare cycles, open up a couple QBR decks and just pull out that one slide and just that'll give you a, you know some some sampling of like top deals. I um, I don't want to test it because I think that if I poke into what a pile is doing and, I, and I'm pretty sure that maybe O'Neill has something similar. Uh, I'll try to figure that out. But then almost certainly they also, also maybe have like even just a dashboard where then we can just pull out the top ops and I will set it to do to myself. So I've attached the dashboard in the last meeting. Um, there is a sales dashboard that, that gets shared in the worldwide sales calls. Yeah. So that captures the latest. Uh, where do I put it? Boom. Sami has already got it. So this dashboard has the top opportunities by dollar amount, or let's just poke into it for a moment. I will not uh, share my screen so we can put this on YouTube. Um, good catch, good catch. But, okay. So this is, this is a helpful dashboard. If you look at this, there's like a forecast, there's top by region, um, so here's, here's a place to start. So, uh, I'm going to put this again on, on next week's meeting so that we can kind of keep this conversation going, but I think we have a few action items out of this meeting and some few tactics and I'm going to set, I'm going to set to do's to do team review this dashboard and to do William add, uh, 
add the four reasons to be in the sales motion to the handbook. So I'll try to document a summary of this conversation. Uh, I felt like this was really valuable and worth our time. I realize we're now like five, we've got like five or 10 minutes left. Um, and there is another important thing. So on point three, here is the issue, I think. Yeah. Uh, so here is a question from the UX team who is working on redesigning these competitive pages. And their ask is um, for this part of the page, right? So they're gonna redesign the graphic. They're working on this and you all have done your like 15 features. And so then the question is for the bottom part of the page, what should this format be like? Now, I probably know for a fact we don't want this tiering information because we don't want to put every feature. We want to keep that list consumable. So in order to make it consumable, it's going to be summary in some fashion. So that capability may include functionality that's in multiple tiers. It's not always going to be neatly in one tier. Does that make sense? Um, so we probably don't want the tier information. The question is, does this look, a, look like a good format? Like there's a, the name of the capability and then some descriptor of it. What, what are you all envisioning for, for the competitive sections? We were talking about rating them zero, one, and two, which uh, may actually be necessary when you think about things like, well, it's, it's, it's in their product, but it costs money, it's in ours and it's free or something where there's some, there's some meaningful difference and we want to pick a one or a two instead of a zero or a one. And so maybe we need indicators of that here. I'm not sure that we do, but maybe we do. So that, so that, it, that, is, uh, that will be in here. So green check mark is okay. two, that's a yes. Red X is a zero, that's a no. And then the, we have another little symbol that is- uh, is, that, is that like yellow, yellow. or orange thing? Yeah, it's yeah, kind of okay. like partial. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's so our zero, one, or two will end up on the page as like so. We'll basically should have the name of the feature. Um, this is like zero, one, or two, and then maybe some descriptors. So this is kind of what I think. I think in in phase one, we have just a description of that capability. So you have the name of the capability and a generic descriptor that that one descriptor could be put on any page. In stage two or in some future iteration, this paragraph could be specific to the competitor, right? So you could, like, like this one says, like Bitbucket Cloud was built with cloud in mind, although this also seems like it could be generic, whether they're comparing us to GitLab or anybody else. Um, but does that kind of make sense? Like, so that you would, you would get tasked as a team, you've now selected your 15 features, there's then a step where you mark zero, one, or two for, I don't know, the top three tools. And then a future ask soon, probably still within this quarter, would be draft a description of that capability. And it would be like a two sentence, a one to two sentence descriptor. Uh, and then the idea is it'd be generic for all the tools to start, but then at some point in the future, it could be specific. Does that sound like a reasonable ask? Uh, yeah, it does to me, and it sounds like we're going to need that, especially when we start looking at these as kind of partners where they're going to have, we're going to want this to be fairly friendly. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we're going to want to set that context. We should definitely be sure to inform the design and the teams and anyone else working on the site that we do want that to be variable eventually. Good call. So is there any other information that we would want in this block? Any other, like a link somewhere or another section or? I, I think we definitely want at least a free text, the ability to put in a free text link because if they're partners, we'll probably have a partner page that we're linking to. So the, the partner page link will be um, like at the top of the page or it'll be like for the whole page. Okay. I don't think we would link it for every feature. Like if there's like 15 features, 
right. or 15 capabilities. We wouldn't put a link on each block there, but. Um, what, what if we had a video or something that we wanted to, yeah. Yeah, definitely for our, for our technology partners, we should have a comparison. This is not a competitive, it's a comparison page because somebody's gonna have the question. They're gonna be like, well, Google has Google Cloud Build. How yeah. does Google Cloud Build compare to GitLab CI? Well, we should have a page on that. And that page should link to our partner page that says, here's all the ways that you can use GitLab and Google together. Uh, what well, if we did kind of like Legos, you know, and like had all these elements, but it kept it kind of lean for the actual visual, just capability, name of the capability that could be a, an anchor link with the score. And then if it has an anchor link, it clicks down, it goes into the detail where it compares. And that way, if we build it, first step is get them all together, score them, have the visual. And then when the descriptions that, come, they just anchor link down to where they're at, kind of all in one little area, though, not like a long laundry list, right? Like it should be wieldy. Right. That's exactly how they're designing the page. So they'll yeah, be like, okay, cool. graphic, it'll look like this or maybe like this or, you know, they're. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so th there'll be this kind of graphic with the scoring at the top. Okay. Um, actually, uh, what is this? Like, there's a chart that, um, anyway, like it could look like this or it could be like, the way I think of it is like a D&D &D chart where there's like a circle and it has like, or like Pokemon, if you all know what I'm talking about. I do, That's, um, I did not think about that. That's so one of the ideas was instead of visually representing it with these like bars, a good way to represent this is like on a stats chart, um, like uh, anyway. So that might be a cool way to do it. I'm just, I'm leaving it up to the UX team to figure out the best UX. We're just supplying the underlying data, yeah. but there'll be some visual graphic because we found that those are helpful to people. And then they can click, it's like to see like, well, how did it come up with this score? And then that'll go down the page to like a list of features, like, like we have today. But instead of being like a list of like 437 features on one page, it will be like 15 consumable capabilities. Um, so I'm, the summary takeaway that I'm going is, is, is we're basically saying use this exact layout, you know, feature comparison, uh, name, of the, name of the capability, a little descriptor, and then zero, one, or two for that section. And then we want to tell them, hey, we want this to be variable because to start, it'll be the same for all of them. So we can just get it up quickly, but then we'll want to iterate to make it specific so we could say something specific. Uh, that's super helpful. Let's chat for a moment. I um, apologize, Cindy. Uh, let's come back to number four. But I just, while we're on the topic of Samya, you're asking about uh, configure. So that the summary of this is that I've asked this every single time we've done this exercise, like, do we get rid of configure because it's a little bit weird? <laughs> um, and so I, I've chatted with Kenny about it and Kenny was like, has been of the opinion that yes, we should keep those. And so my thought is as long as we make the page clear that we don't do what, you know, uh, I don't know, chef, like chef does. So if it's, if the set of 15, if the set of 10 to 15 capabilities, like there's probably seven of them that we don't have, like we just don't do that. And so when the little visual graphic is clear, like chef does like their point on this part is really high and our point is low, uh, but we do do some infrastructure configuration stuff. And we should have that kind of listed. That's that's my thought on it is yes, we have it, but we just make it clear. And in, in the description, it should be clear like Chef is, does this, GitLab doesn't do that. GitLab does this, people use GitLab with Chef. If you've got Kubernetes, you probably don't need Chef. Does that sound right? It does. Um, and maybe we can <clears throat> chat on our one-on-one -on -one a okay. little bit more about this because I think there is some level of overlap between what we capture as features in CD and configure. So we might want to be very clear about <clears throat> where we want to put the features. Excuse me. Okay, let's <clears throat> let's follow up one-to-one. -one. Um, 
I'll just say quickly on seven that Harsh will schedule a call with this team. Um, so I know that's on his plan. So look for that soon. Uh, Cindy, do you want to say anything about number four? Just, I would encourage everybody to follow the conversations in the, um, the security channel that I've put there. So, um, 30 second background on this. Um, Sid challenged me to see what we needed to do to grow security more. And so I put together a plan that's very broad and um, need to make some short-term progress on it. Some of the items are more longer term, but put it, I put together a Slack channel to start pulling in mail since a lot of it is messaging and, and other folks. And Danielle asked on Friday, why are we, why is security important? <laughs> um, and so I kind of got honestly irritated and said, well, maybe David and Sid would like to answer that question. And Pyle jumped in and answered it as well. And so um, you, he's got a document. Yes, it's outdated. I've asked him if there's something more current, but it's still pretty insightful in terms of where he's coming from and how he thinks about sales plays and sales progress and growth. Um, so I would just encourage you to look at Pyle's document and follow along in that channel. Because the other thing is Danielle kind of, I think had an aha moment that there's more opportunity on the inbound side to guide people towards security as well. And part of the genesis for the urgency of the web piece and the messaging was we went out with the MQ last week where we did really well. And so we're talk and talking about, hey, we're a DevSecOps company and we're really good in security. And then you go to the homepage and there's nothing about security on the homepage. So I was trying to resolve that quickly and unfortunately didn't reach that resolution, but at least there's, there's a lot of healthy discussion at the right levels about this. So follow along. Cool. Cool. Uh, I'll just say one note, we gotta, we gotta hop off, but uh, Alita put together a wonderful Microsoft report. She has a list of suggestions um, so those are things that we can take as a team and start to follow up on. Uh, Cormac and Brian, I will share in particular two of the top items, actually, and Parker, I think this covers your space as well. So one of the ideas is that uh, Microsoft is doing more agile stuff with agile. So as part of our agile, our agile play and our agile thinking, we need to involve some you know, competitive Intel there. Um, and then Parker and Brian, there is obviously always uh, GitHub and GitHub Actions content. So um, review that document, look for the stuff that applies to you. Think about what should my follow-up to this be? And maybe the follow-up is I don't do anything with this, but maybe the follow-up is, okay, I created an issue and I add this to my plan or there's, I think it, it's up to you. Uh, so review the document, think about what your next action would be and reach out to Alita to coordinate with her because then I know she's also like, for example, in another, some private, I hate these stupid freaking group, group channels. I don't know if you all get these people slack you. And it's like, you know, I have like the Cindy Samuel William channel, the Cindy Samuel William Cormac channel, the Cindy Samuel William Cormac <laughs> yeah. channel. Like, was this- Hey, don't, don't involve me. I try <laughs> not to do that. <laughs> no, 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 you are really good at not doing it. But I'm saying like, I currently have like four or five conversations that are like this, but any, in one of these dumb channels, uh, I have a message and it's like, Alita's like, yes, I'm, and it's not Alita's fault either. Other people have started these channels, but she, she's working on Agile and she said, yes, I'm working on Agile. Yes, I'll loop in Cormac. So anyway, that's my final word on that. So <laughs> thank you, thank you team. <laughs> Bye.